the new risk assessment standards are effective at the end of 2023. So are you ready? The first thing I want to say is the conceptual aspect of risk assessment is not changing, but some of the particulars are. And as we go through the video, you're going to see how this new SAS 145 it will affect your future audits. I've created a flowchart to try to make this more understandable. As we begin, I want you to think about the financial statements that you're going to audit. Specifically, think about the balance sheet, the income statement, and the notes to the financials. So as you begin the risk assessment process, you may want to reach for the prior year financial statements and get those fresh in your mind. You want to be thinking about what are the material areas on the balance sheet, the income statement, and in the notes. And so grab your prior year financial statements, take a look. If you do have the current year financials, if you're lucky enough to have that, then take a look at those. And we're going to take a look and see what are the material amounts in the financial statements. As we go to this screen, I want you to pretend for a moment that materiality is $100,000. If it is, the numbers that are material for this year would be cash, inventories, uh, PP&E, and then the land held for investment. Now, uh, you would want to continue to look at the rest of the balance sheet and income statement. I'm just showing you this as an example. So as we continue to look at the flow chart, I want you to think about two things. Uh, the first thing is materiality like we were just doing. And the second thing is the probability in this statement. Those two factors in relation to inherent risk is going to drive much of the audit process. So continuing with the flow chart, we look at each line in those respective financial statements. Then we're going to ask the question, is there an amount that is a material or do we have a disclosure that would be material? If the answer is no, then we're not going to do anything in that area. So say you had prepaid assets and they were not material, then you would stop at this point. Now, you can audit an immaterial am amount, but you don't have to. So part of this standard, or really the whole standard, I should say, is trying to make us focus on what is most important. So when we look at materiality and probability of misstatement, that will cause us to look at those areas that are most important. It'll cause us to plan procedures in those areas where we might have a material misstatement. So let's continue with the flow chart. We look at we look to see whether or not there's a material amount. And then our next question, if if the answer to this question is yes, then we're going to proceed. And the next question will be, is the risk of material misstatement greater than 20% or more than remote? So most of the time when audit standards talk about a more than remote, uh, everything I've always heard people use a 20% uh, amount there. So that's what we're going to do here. Now, SAS 145 does not say 20%, but I'm trying to give you some type of benchmark to go by. So use the percent you think represents more than remote. I'm going to use 20%. So if the risk of material misstatement is greater than 20%, say for 
inventory, then we have uh, we have a risk of material misstatement. So we saw earlier that the inventory amount was material. Now we're saying we think there's more than a 20% chance that inventory might be misstated based on the inherent risk factors. And this piece is really important, inherent risk factors. So let's look and see what that means. So the standard SAS 145 defines those inherent risk factors as change, subjectivity, complexity, uncertainty, and susceptibility to fraud. Now, I don't think these are the only factors that impact inherent risk. For example, volume might affect inherent risk, but these are the ones that are listed in SAS 145. So when you look at inventory, for example, you know, which one of these factors might affect the whether or not there would be a misstatement in inventory? Well, complexity might affect that, uh, that amount, the inventory amount. Uh, if you've got changes in the way that the company's handling the inventory accounting, then that could impact whether or not there would be a, a misstatement. So you look at these factors, and then based on the inherent risk factors, you're going to answer this question. Is the risk of material misstatement greater than 20% based on those factors? So going back to my inventory example, we're saying yes, if, if the answer is no, then you stop in regard to that line item like inventory or cash or payables. If you don't think there's more than a 20% chance of a misstatement, then you're not going to do anything else. If you think there's more than a 20% chance, then you're going to proceed down this flow chart. So if we say yes, we think there's more than a 20% chance of misstatement, that gets us to this, uh, this node. And this box says, okay, if the above is true, in other words, it's a material amount, and then we believe there's more than a remote chance of misstatement, then we're going to have at least one relevant assertion. So what is a relevant assertion? Let's uh, blow this up so we can take a closer look at that definition. So the definition of a relevant assertion is here. It's an assertion of, about a class of transactions, account balance, or disclosure is relevant when it has an identified risk of material misstatement. And risk of mat material misstatement exists when there's a reasonable possibility of a misstatement and if, uh, if it were to occur, that misstatement, if it did occur, that it's material. So we had asked these questions, is it material? And then is there more than a remote chance that there's a misstatement? When we look at that definition of a relevant assertion, it's asking, is there a reasonable possibility, which means, is it more than remote? And then also, is it material? So those two things are going to drive whether or not we're going to plan procedures in relation to, say, inventory or cash or debt or whatever. Now, when we think about assertions, you can see examples here, uh, existence, completeness, rights and obligations, accuracy, valuation, allocation, and cutoff. 
So those are, are common assertions. So what you want to do is you want to think about these assertions in relation to your balance sheet. So as you look at that cash line item, then the existence assertion would probably be in play for cash. Or as you look at uh, inventory, then the valuation assertion would probably be in play. So again, you want to start by looking at the balance sheet income statement disclosures then you start thinking about these assertions and you're asking yourself, are there any relevant assertions in relation to these balance sheet amounts, such as cash and inventory, PP&E? So if there are assertions that are relevant, again, they're material and there's more than a remote chance of misstatement, then we're going to plan to do something about it. We're going to develop audit procedures to respond to that risk. Okay, we've already covered a lot of ground, so let me just summarize where we are so far. We look at, say, the balance sheet. We look at a particular line item, such as cash. Then we think about the potential relevant assertions such as existence. And then we're asking ourselves, you know, is that amount, that cash amount, material? And then do I think, based on the risk assessment factors, such as change and subjectivity, uh, such as susceptibility to fraud? So if you think, okay, there's a chance that cash could be stolen. If you feel like there's more than a 20% chance that that might occur, then okay, we have a relevant assertion that is existence and, and really completeness as, as well. You could bring that into the equation. So think about those assertions. Think about whether or not the line item is material. Think about whether or not there's a probability more than 20% chance of misstatement. Once we get to that point, then we have a relevant assertion and we need to plan some responses, some audit procedures in relation to those account balances or disclosures. Okay, so if you have a relevant assertion, that's also going to mean that you have a significant class. Uh, the definition of a significant class is, uh, and I'll just read it, significant class of transactions, account balance, or disclosure. Those are, are a class of transactions, account balance, or disclosure for which there is one or more relevant assertions. So how do you know if you've got a significant class? Well, that would be a class of transactions and account balance or disclosure where there's one or more relevant assertions. So if inventory, if we look at it and the valuation assertion is in play, then inventory would, would be a significant class, a significant account balance. So if, if it is a significant class, then substantive procedures would be required for that area. So if we say cash is, is a significant account balance and we say inventory is a significant account balance, we're going to need substantive procedures for each of those account balances. Now, the next thing that we need to look at is whether or not there is a significant risk. Now, above, we were using a 20% threshold. Now, we're going to use an 80% threshold to determine whether or not there is a significant risk in relation to these accounts. 
Now, again, the 20% and the 80% amounts that I'm using, those are just amounts that I am using. That's really not in SAS 145. But just trying to give you some general ideas about how you might approach this. So above, we said, is, you know, is, is the risk of material misstatement greater than 20%? based on those inherent risk factors. Now we've come down the flow chart and we've gotten to this point and we're asking, is the risk of material misstatement greater than 80, 80%? Now why am I using 80%? Well, if we look at this definition of a significant risk, it's one uh, in which the assessment of inherent risk is, is close to the upper end of the spectrum of inherent risk due to the degree to which the inherent risk factors affect the likelihood of misstatement and the magnitude of the potential misstatement should that occur. Now, again, the risk factors listed in SAS 145 are these. So based on these risk factors, we're now asking, is there more than an 80% chance of misstatement? Now, why did I pick 80%? Because the definition says close to the upper end of the spectrum of risk. So in my mind, on a 10-point scale, anything that say, and, you know, 80%, 90% in there would be toward the upper end of the spectrum of risk and therefore would be a significant risk. Now, if you say there's not an 80% chance, then it's not a significant risk. So if you think there's only a 50% chance of misstatement based on these inherent risk factors, if you think it's 50%, then you're going to say, no, it's not a significant risk. If you say there's a 90% chance of misstatement, because let's say you're looking at an estimate and it's very complex and very subjective, then you're going to deem that, that assertion that account balance has a significant risk. So if you look at inventory and you're thinking the valuation part of inventory is pretty complicated, there's some estimates involved in there, and you just feel like, okay, there's a real high chance of a misstatement in relation to valuation for inventory then inventory is going to be a significant risk area. If it is, then you will need to plan extended procedures, including a test of details. So any account class like inventory or cash or debt or whatever, if it's a significant risk, you, you have to perform a test of details for that area, and specifically in relation to the relevant assertion for that account balance. Wow, we've really covered a lot of ground in this video, but hopefully as you go through the flow chart and you think about these concepts and shake it all down, it's not overly complicated. So simply just think about your balance sheet, income statement, disclosures, and then you ask yourself, where are the material amounts? Where are the material disclosures? And then you're going to ask yourself, what are the assertions in play for those material areas? Next, we're going to ask, based on those risk factors like change and subjectivity, like the potential for fraud, based on those risk factors, 
is there more than a 20% chance that a misstatement is present? If, if there is, then you've got relevant assertions. If you have relevant assertions, then you have significant classes of transactions or significant account balances or significant disclosures. If they are significant, then you need to plan substantive procedures. And then we said, if there's a significant risk, and now we're using that 80% threshold in terms of the risk of misstatement based on the risk factors like change in subjectivity. If we think there's more than an 80% chance of misstatement, then we have a significant risk. We need to do some pretty extensive audit procedures and we have to do a test of details. So I've tried to summarize 145 and make it easy for you to understand. Uh, you'll need to implement this standard for your calendar year 2023 engagements. But now you're ready to do so, and you can always go back and watch the video again if you need a refresher. So I hope this helps until we meet again. Take care and bye now.